Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Ashes World. Today, we have a very special guest, Fintan O'Toole. Uh, welcome here. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Wonderful. And uh, how would you briefly introduce yourself? What would you tell our audience in any way you see fit, in any way you like? So my name is Fintan O'Toole, um, which is, uh, people might guess, a very Irish name. So uh, I come from Dublin in Ireland, although uh, I'm talking to you from Princeton in New Jersey, uh, where I uh, where I teach. And um, I, I, I grew up in Dublin. I was born in 1958, um, grew up there, uh, very working class background and um, became a journalist. And so I spent most of my life really writing largely about Ireland, Irish culture, Irish history, Irish society. Um, but I, I also I also write um, about America and Britain. And uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a magpie, you know, if if. Um, <laughs> Something really interests me. I I try to to learn more about it and 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 try and write about it. So, I often write for the New York Review of Books or things like that, where, where you kind of write longer pieces. And sometimes you're kind of writing about things that you're just learning about yourself uh, as you're going along, which I think kind of keeps you alive uh, if you're if you're somebody who's involved in thinking and writing. Yeah, I find it fascinating too. Before we get started to, to talk about your book, I I feel like a sort of affiliation with with Ireland, and I'm not sure where it comes from. I did a DNA test too, uh, with, uh, to find out. So that I do not have maybe probably one percent, but not not much at least. So, but I find that fascinating too. And there's so much that is it's a, it's a small place, but there's so much that uh, there is to offer. And I, I want to look at one of my favorite writers of all time is Jane Joyce. So, so, so there you go. But um, so your book is, we don't know uh, ourselves, a personal history of modern Ireland. Um, uh, what is your book about and how do you approach things? And uh, let's, let's dive into it. So, you know, in, in a way um, that I, I was asking myself the same question, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I obviously, as I said, I've been writing about Ireland for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I've accumulated a certain amount of knowledge and hopefully some insight over that time. But uh, I, I thought I was getting to an age where I probably should try and put it all together. But that's not a good enough reason to write a book, you know. And, uh, there's lots of histories, you know, there's lots of very good histories and, and uh, lots of excellent historians. And, you know, so but the, it, it really I only really kind of knew what the book was when I came up with that subtitle, which is a personal history, you know, mm -hmm, exactly. I, I thought maybe there was a way of writing about this interesting place, you know, because it's a place which has changed so radically uh, as a story. I mean, just to tell it as a story. So so write it as almost as if you were writing a novel, uh, e even though everything in it is is factual, you know, mm -hmm. Um uh, and and you know you use your own voice your own uh, experience your own family as a way in so what i try to do in the book is usually kind of have a story or a moment you know might be very ordinary in a way but as a little sort of aperture which opens up into the much bigger issues about what's what's going on in ireland you know mm -hmm. And I think that works really well. So just to interrupt you, because I think that that we can res it resonates with us that that personal perspective. Because one of the issues I have with some of it's lots of facts, but there we miss that kind of like something that gets me going. Like like good movies too, because you you have the background. We're learning about things. At the same time, we are attracted by the story and this character. And the character here is is yourself. So yeah. I, I I I I love that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, I, I mean, that's really what I hoped, you know, that uh, I, I suppose what what um, what I only realized really when I'd written the book is that it's it, it sort of using my own little microcosm to open up the macrocosm of Ireland. Mm -hmm. But also then it kind of struck me that maybe Ireland is a kind of a little microcosm for so much of the world, you know, or at least of the Western world, but also maybe of the developing world, too, you know, because uh it, it it it's a story that just goes from my own kind of very ordinary life, but uh, but but it does encompass big things like you know globalization and modernization and all those huge words. You know what do they mean? What do they? What's it like to live through them? Really, is so there's lots of books of theory and 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 will explain to you you know what what these things mean. But what's it like to live in a place which is changing so radically because it's going from being this actually quite backward. Uh, inward looking place uh, which it was when I was born 
uh, to, you know, being one of the most globalized economies in the world now, you know, and I, I think it's a story that a lot of people in America kind of know in their own lives in a way, because it's such a migrant society anyway. And, but also, I think maybe somebody, I think if you were from India, for example, you might, you might understand it because, you know, certainly lots of parts of India would be going through something very similar, you know, which is going from, you know, maybe within one generation or two generations, people going from people living a kind of very, very um, basic rural lifestyle, you know, to to a high tech economy, you know, and, mm -hmm. and what what does that feel like is, is really what I was trying to describe. And exactly, I'd like to know, what, what, what was that like? I mean, we because we have a place that is uh, physically also secluded from, from the rest of an island, right? And then all these changes that are happening in terms of technology and the, you know, the mention of Westerns taking over Irish television, and you have like a, a place that is deep in the past and traditions and so on, but suddenly these new waves of changes are appearing. So how did that feel and how was it not overwhelming in, in many ways to adapt to the, the changes? Yeah, you know, it, 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 the thing with, I suppose it's true of all historical processes, you know, is that it, it it's not just a straight line, you know, so it doesn't, it, yes, if you take the beginning point and the end point, you know, which I, you have to do, it's a chronological narrative, you know, but of course they're incredibly different. But I try to get the sense that actually, the reason for trying to get your own personal life into it is that, of course, you don't know how it's going to turn out. You know, <laughs> like that lived experience isn't like the experience of historians. Historians go into the archives and they can, you know, they can read all the stuff that we don't know about at the time. You know, yeah. what are the politicians thinking and yeah. you know, what are the, what are all the secrets that are, <laughs> that are at work? And of course, ordinary people don't know that at the time, you know. So so uh so for, for me as a kid, it was very exciting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt like uh, certainly the early part of my life, you know, where just things were getting better, you know. I mean, there's been frankly in a very poor place, you know, for most people. I mean, there were, as in all societies, there were people who did very well and who were very comfortable, very happy with the way things were. But, you know, uh, at just a simple level, like my my parents, for example, who were, you know, very bright people, but they never got an education, you know, they, they never got a high school education, never mind college, you know. And and they were typical of working class people at the time there, you know. And uh, it, it was a kind of struggle to... to to, to live or to do anything. But there was a real sense, you know, uh, as things were opening up in the 1960s and 1970s, that things were becoming possible, you know. And so it was possible for me to imagine that I might go to university, for example, which nobody ever in my entire prehistory had ever done, you know. Um, and I think uh, one of the things I write about in the book, you know, is, is uh, the visit of John F. Kennedy to Ireland in 1963. Because you know, here we were, and as you said, we were this. We had a we had traditions and, and and a sense of identity, and a lot of it was bound up with Catholicism, of course. You know, being the Irish Catholic thing, yeah. and yet we were trying to modernize. And how do you how do you put those two things together? You know, and here along comes the Irish Catholic president of America. You know, who is modern, glamorous, young, um, represents you know this all this newness and idealism. You know. Um, uh, and at the same time, he's he also represents our past. You know, he's he's one of us. You know, <laughs> and he he came from you know a small Irish town, or his people did, mm -hmm. and he's come back. You know, I mean, in retrospect, it's a bit weird. I think his 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 advisors were kind of perplexed, like, what on earth is he doing, going to Ireland for three days as president of America, and wandering around mm -hmm. and shaking hands with his. Mm -hmm sixth cousins and you know that stuff but it, he he also needed it you know it was a kind of important yeah. for him yeah. and so you 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 have these moments or actually i suppose which are like uh you know reconciliations of two opposite things and make you feel actually this is going to be okay you know there's a way of doing this uh, and of course it, it it doesn't quite work out like that because uh, of course then there's over time the more the place changes the more tension there is between mm -hmm. The traditions and particularly the sort of conservative Catholicism and the nature of social and cultural change. Yeah, I want to dive into that uh, in a few moments, but I'm just thinking of, of Joe Biden right now, who, uh, unlike me, has Irish roots. 
And so is is the sentiment kind of similar or is it very different? I mean, of, of course, they're very, completely different people. And uh, uh, JFK, the youthful energy that he brings was is, is kind of lacking here and not, not through any fault of, of Joe Biden's own. But um, is there some sort of excitement there, Thrill? Or uh, would, how would you see it? There's a real sense of connection, you know, um, and again, it's 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 mutual, I think, you know. Um, uh, so Biden grew up adoring the Kennedys, you know, JFK and, and then Robert Kennedy. Um, and I suppose, you know, Edward Kennedy would have been a sort of early mentor for him in the Senate, all that, you know. So he, in a way, he sort of chose to have this Irish Catholic identity because his name is Biden, which is not an Irish name. You know, he has Irish on one side of his family and I think English and French on the other side. So he could have gone in any, you know, in any direction, like a lot of Americans could, you know. But he really did very much choose this Irish Catholic identity. Some of it's religious. I think he's a very kind of um, faithful, believing Catholic, you know, means a lot to him. Uh, but the Irish thing is is really very real for him. You know, when he was vice president, he, he spent a lot of time in Ireland and, going, you know, the same thing, like going back and meeting cousins and relatives and, uh, and he's a popular figure in Ireland, of course, I think for, for, for that same reason, you know, that, that it sort of does connect nicely, you know, and uh, there's a, a sense, you know, Ireland's been through, there's been a lot of tension around Brexit and Northern Ireland, and, you know, and Biden has been a very good friend to Ireland, you know, to, uh, he, he's, he made it very clear to the British that they were not to mess around Ireland you know, <laughs> in all of this process. And, and of course, some of that's, political but a lot of it is emotional you know a lot of it is this sense of i, I mean I, I just remember when he when he was when he won the election you know and the, all the journalists were out on him the bbc you know usually you know bbc is bbc and this guy from, i'm from the bbc and he said i don't care about the bbc i'm irish <laughs> you know you think oh wow you know it was just a strange kind of moment um and i mean these are small things in a way but but they, they do get us into a, a a larger thing in a way which is which goes to your question really about you know how do you manage this process and and, and one way you manage it is by sort of uh you know ha having figures who somehow make the contradiction not seem so bad you know and the the big contradiction in irish history really you know modern irish history is is mass emigration right so you know people in america know this right you know because they've got if they're not have they don't have some irish roots themselves they have friends and neighbors and colleagues who do you know um and you know, you 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 think of there are what six million people on the island of Ireland. There's about forty million people who identify as Irish American, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then you've got Britain and Australia, and you know, so so you have this actually quite small place, which is, mm -hmm. you know, has had this influence on the world simply through mass migration, uh, which is is a failure. You know, it's a failure to you know a place couldn't hold its own population because of poverty and oppression and all sorts of reasons, but it, it sort of creates this sort of double mindedness you know what is irish you know yeah. is it sort of traditional old agricultural ireland or where are the irish people where are the descendants of mm -hmm. the people who were in ireland in the 1840s you know well they're in boston and new york and chicago and london and sydney you know they, they were very modern you know they went to cities they they were part of the modern world so we always had this double thing going on you know and in a way the story I tell in my book is almost like just a story of all of that coming home, you know, of, I mean, for, for generations, Irish people, Irish workers, Irish labor went to where the capital was, you know, which was in America mostly. <laughs> and now what starts to happen in the 1960s is that the capital starts coming to where the labor is, you know, so you get American companies investing in Ireland and setting up, setting up, uh, you know, at first kind of really basic factories, but then some of the most technologically advanced places in, in the world, you know. Uh, so it's it's a sort of long circular kind of flow of things going out of Ireland, people going out of Ireland, and then somehow it all comes back home to us in, from the 1960s. It's kind of brain drain, but it does come back, and it's kind of like a cycle there. I, I love the title, We Don't Know Ourselves. And still, so many people, they act as if they do, and I don't think they do. And so in, in the case of, of Ireland, I find it fascinating, but also scary of the, the conflicts that exist and existed uh, in, in the past, too, and how people are identifying along lines of religion instead of identifying in terms of common things that they have and nationality and their identity. So um, what is uh, going on there, in other words? Yeah, so, you know, I I, I was, 
as I said, born in Dublin, which is the Republic of Ireland. Uh, you know, Ireland was partitioned in 1921. And so you have Northern Ireland, which is the northeastern corner of the island. I mean, it had always been sort of regarded as one island. I mean, that didn't happen before. But because of these religious differences and also differences, they mapped onto differences as to whether you wanted Irish independence or you wanted to stay as part of the United Kingdom uh, with, with, with Britain. Most Protestants wanted to stay with Britain and most Catholics wanted independence. Right? So, so it's... It's this toxic mix of politics and religion. Mm, mm. They're both very fine things in themselves, you know, but when you put them together, the outcomes are seldom very good. Uh, so you had in Northern Ireland, really, Northern Ireland was, was basically just established to have a Protestant majority. That That's what it was there for. Um, and it was the wealthiest part of the country. It was where all the industry was, you know, all the, the most uh, highly developed parts of the country were there. But Catholics were... Um, an oppressed minority, really, you know, it wasn't for them. So you had about a third of the population, you know, who were who were really kind of made clear to them that they were second class citizens. And this was going to blow up at some point, you know. Um, um, uh, and uh, actually, this is oddly, you could say it's part of this process of connecting with America, because one of the big inspirations, of course, was the civil rights movements in America, you know. And I think, I mean, I, I may be wrong about this, but I think it's the first example we have of a a movement, a political movement in a in a white European country, which is directly inspired by a black movement, you know, mm, who identified very much with the civil rights movement and mm. sang "We Shall Overcome" and all, you know, <laughs> and actually some of their same tactics. And so, it it starts out in a way as a you know a very admirable Martin Luther King, non-violence, but you know, pr provoking the authorities, you know, and, and asserting yourself. And then the reaction of the authorities is is so bad that it leads to violence, and and then it just descends, you know. And one of the scary, I think you said it was scary, you know. You're absolutely right because, I mean, I remember I was maybe ten years old when this this started to happen, you know. And if you if you had said at ten or you'd said to anybody really at that time, this will still be going on when you're forty, mm -hmm. you know. I would have sat come and give me a break. You know, that's ridiculous. Couldn't be, it couldn't be the case. But it was 30 years of conflict, you know. And as you said, the the the, the tragedy is that these are white Christian people, you know, they, they watch the same TV programs, they eat the same food, they yeah, exactly. you know, largely kind of live the same life. Yeah. Um I think Sigmund Freud had the phrase about the narcissism of small differences, you know, and re really that was a a, a a very strong example of it. And, we're we're just coming up now to the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, you know that that ended it effectively, um, and you know it, uh, it. We were kind of lucky because uh, the, I tried to describe this in the book. You know that it was just like that. It just it, it had settled down into a pattern where the violence was self-generating. Yeah. So, so so the reason I was going to kill you is because one of your people had killed one of my people. You know, I'm you know I just. And and most people, you have to remember, most people did not want this. You know, most people weren't part of it, hated it, did not support uh, terrorism. But, you know, if something happens, it was an outrage in your community. If somebody comes in and puts a bomb in your community, a bit of your brain starts thinking, well, I, I don't want somebody else to suffer, but somebody's got to hit back at those guys. You know, this, this sort of ambivalence that was there for a long time. And it's actually very, very hard to stop that. You know, yeah. it, it goes on and on. And we were very lucky in a way that's kind of, it reached a point where the leaders of say the, the IRA, the, 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 the Republican uh, Catholic uh, paramilitary organization and the leaders of the loyalist ones on the other side were just kind of getting into middle age. Uh, and they all had kids and maybe some of them were beginning to have grandkids. And they're just starting to think, is this, are my kids gonna be doing the same thing? Are my grandkids gonna be doing the same thing? And if it had gone on for into another generation, you know, it could have lasted another 30 years because there's a sort of blithesness that young people can have about all this stuff, you know. But as you get older, you start thinking this is just going nowhere. And it aligns. We were kind of lucky because Bill Clinton was president of the United States and Tony Blair in his prime was had just come to that power in, in, in Britain. And, you know, they may have been somewhat tarnished figures later on, but at the time they were kind of the star superstars of, of Western politics, you know, and they both, to be fair to them, you know, really got involved and and and, and did a huge amount of work in, in trying to bring people together. And so, again, we were kind of fortunate uh, that 
we, we, the timing finally worked out in Ireland's favour. And that's helped a lot, you know. It's so e even though the Republic of Ireland never really had this level of violence at all, but you know, it's sixty miles away, seventy miles away. So it, it has a huge psychological effect on you, you know. And um, we sure had sure as hell don't want to go back there. Yeah, I, I watched a, a documentary, Young Plato, uh, recently about uh, Belfast, the Ardoin region, and so it focuses on 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 kids and on boys in the uh, Holy Cross uh, Primary School. And um, I found it very, very touching and very moving because uh, these are the kids here who are confused by everything that's happening, the, the effects it has on them. And so they fight with each other because that's what they, they copied from, from home, from the parents, from the uh, environment that they're growing up in. And the fact that there is a lot of issues with uh, with drugs and drug addiction, which is directly linked to the conflicts, and yeah. I just I just find it very hard to take, you know, of like putting aside those differences. And they are deep differences, and of course, right. But at some point, saying like, you know, let's let's stop. This is enough. We are harming the next generations, and uh, often yeah. I don't see enough of that, which is very sad. I, I, I very strongly agree with you. I think you, you put it really well. You know, uh, I think the thing we underestimate about conflicts is the long tail, you know, of psychological damage, and trauma. It's intergenerational, you know, e even if it stops, you know, so so even if you're lucky enough that act, you know, most of the violence actually stops. But, you know, you, you have kids who've seen it, you know, you have families who've been torn apart by it, you know, and you, you have this very long legacy of, of uh, pain, you know, and it, it as you say, it expresses itself in 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 substance abuse, very high suicide level still in in Northern Ireland and working class communities. You know, yeah. um, so you, you know, it, it, I mean, I I think Ireland's become a vastly better place, and and I think it's become a place where people do have a sense actually that your identity has to be plural. It, you know, it has mm -hmm. to be. A, but we haven't done that because we're great people and we're so you know we're the most enlightened people in the world. We've done it because we've seen in the most distant way and the intimate way, you know, what it looks like if you don't do that, you know. Uh, 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 so we I hope we've learned lessons um, you know, that 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 uh, identity, you know, identity, it's us and them. And if you start defining your identity about what you're not, we're not them. You know, yeah, that's toxic, you know, but it's easier, of course, sometimes than saying, well, who are we? You know, we don't yeah. know ourselves. I mean, what, you know what? <laughs> it's not but it's that, that process of elimination, though. I'm not we're not them. So who are we? And so that kind of like because identities are fluid. But what, what I find is that at stake here, the issue is we continue how things used to be. And so I respect traditions, but it's like getting into that mindset of like, OK, Times are different. Things are different. The situation is different. The economy is different, and everything. So to adjust to that, instead of like blindly following, this is how the the ancestors used to do it, and now we're going to continue that. So I think there's a moment of like breaking that that kind of chain, that spell that is uh, holding us back. I, I I completely agree. You know, and and actually, of course, the the irony is that when you look at history and you look at the ancestors, you know, <laughs> they were never, it was never simple either. You know, there's always this sort of, um, you know, the golden age idea or nostalgia about the past or, you know, and actually, I, again, one of the reasons I think the Irish story is sort of interesting for, for people outside Ireland too, you know, is that it contradicts this sort of very conservative right-wing idea of what identity is, you know. <laughs> So, so the right wing mentalities are very much focused on culture wars about, you know, identity is fixed. It was given to us from the past, mm -hmm. and it was given to us from the past. The only thing that can happen to it in a way is that it gets it gets undermined and lost, you know, as 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 times change, and and that creates a kind of very paranoid idea of of your identity. But cultures but, change. I mean, cultures is not something that's static. It's it exactly it never was. It never was. You know, it so, never was. Yeah, and you cannot uh, stick yeah. to. I mean, uh, people who would not use credit cards or or technology. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's but that's not how things are going. You know, you are going against the flow of time in many ways. Yeah, and and people have you know what defines a culture for me is that it's a it's a set of tools for, for, for dealing with and adapting to change, <laughs> you know, right. and maybe each, each, what makes us distinctive is we have different sets of tools, mm -hmm. you know, which are 
a product of our environment and our history and our languages and our cultures and all those kind of things, you know, uh, and they're very valuable. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm very respectful of them because I, I, I think they really matter. Mm -hmm. But that's what they are. I mean, they're, they're, they're ways of trying to hold on to the things we value in new contexts. Yes. They're all new that's context. it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you go back to hunter gatherers being faced with, you know, agricultural people coming in, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, how far back do you want to go? You know, like there, there, there's never been a time when people were not faced with, with the challenge of new technologies, new ideas, uh, you know, and, and, and sometimes these challenges are terrible, you know, they can be violent and, 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 and full of conflict. Um, but often, you know, the slower processes are processes of actually of people adapting to change. And, you know, it, it was one of the things that was on my mind and maybe in trying to answer the questions about this, you know, what was I doing in this book that, you know, the, the fear in Ireland was, and it was a very conservative attitude to this, you know, was that all this technological change, all this economic change, all this educational change, you know, is we're going to lose our Irishness. Right? We're, we're, we're not going to be properly Irish anymore, you know. Because uh, uh, you often, cultures that are failing in some ways or, you know, uh, poor, they invest a huge amount in their distinctiveness. And they say, well, yeah, we may be poor, but look, we're we're more Catholic than anybody else. You know, we're spiritually better, you know, this kind of stuff. They compensate these things. And then you start feeling, well, actually, if we if we get more prosperous, are we are we losing these unique things? Some of the unique things are really good to lose, you know, just because they're unique doesn't mean they're necessarily good. I mean, I, I don't think our unique poverty in Western Europe, which we which we had when I was growing up, was a good thing, you know. Yeah. Um and and you know uh, what 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 I would say you know and I'm not I'm very critical of some of modern Ireland it's not a happy clappy story but mm -hmm. but you know I think we're at least as Irish as we ever were I, you know I don't think anybody has any doubt about mm -hmm. Ireland being a distinctive country a distinctive culture mm -hmm. being proud of itself you know I, I certainly don't feel any 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 less proud of being Irish. Uh, you know, than than people would have felt in the 1950s and 1960s. Mm -hmm. What do you think of in culture? We see it in the media and culture now with movies that are coming out that are uh, the, that Ireland is the spotlight in many ways. So, uh, how does that make you feel that uh, we are talking about uh, these these types of programs and movies now? You, you know, I I. I... I love it. You know, I mean, some Irish people would be critical, say, of the Banshees of Inna Sharon, you know, yeah. Mark Donna's movie and say, well, it's, it's pretty know, depressing, so, though. It's a very depressing. It's, depressing. it's set in a mythic past. It's sort of people drinking and mm -hmm. cutting off their fingers. And, you know, it's, it's a sort of certain version of Ireland, you know, mm -hmm. which is established. Uh, but I, I, I don't see it that way at all. You know, I mean, uh, the, the way I see it is that um, stories are stories, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, like, do, do we really think that movies are life you know? yeah, it's true. It's true. i think the more confident you become as a culture mm -hmm. the less hung up you get on you know what image is being shown of us to the to the outside world you know this was a big concern in the 1910s or 1920s 1930s you know when you feel very oppressed and you've been made to feel kind of stereotyped and ashamed of yourself of course people are very very super sensitive about you know how, how are we being seen mm -hmm. I don't care how we're being seen, to be honest. You know, we're okay. human beings. We we tell stories. We, you know, if the story is a good story, if if it's if it's engaging, if it's complex, you know, if it if it uh, if it stays in your head, you know, then then I'm I'm very glad for it to be told. And I mean, I think if you look take take that movie for example, you know, it's 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 superbly acted. I mean, the performances are fantastic in it. A lot of the writing is brilliant. Mm -hmm place looks incredibly beautiful mm -hmm. it, it, you know there's a huge amount to just admire in it and mm -hmm. and so for me as an Irish person I, you know I'm just glad to see Irish performers Irish landscapes Irish writing mm -hmm. uh get getting that kind of attention um mm -hmm. I mean I think there are 14 Irish nominees in mm -hmm. the Oscars you know yeah. <laughs> which is for small places is, is mm -hmm. great and particularly small places that really didn't have a big movie culture right so right. you know our our, a lot of our traditions would be in the novel. You mentioned Joyce, of course, and in yeah. poetry and Yeats and, yeah. and in, in, in the theatre, of course, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's it's great to see that this is, you know, this Irishness is taking different forms. It's going to movies. Uh, people would look at a young 
writer like Sally Rooney, for example, you know, has a huge, huge audience in, around the world, and 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 people of that generation identify with with her work really very, very powerfully. I, I know for my own students, like they've all read Sally Rooney, you know, um, uh, and you, you know, it's it's it it it's what what do you actually want from a culture? You want creativity. Mm-hmm. Full stop. You know, you you just want the sense that there's still it's still producing yeah. interesting things and challenging things and it's is playing this sort of role in the world where it's adding something to the world and mm-hmm. i think i'm very biased obviously but i think ireland still adds a little bit more to the world than its numbers would suggest you know? mm-hmm. exactly what's so what's the irish habit of deliberate unknowing and that kind of goes with the we don't know ourselves kind of uh title that you have so yeah. what uh, how would that fit in what is that exactly yeah, so I mean, this is the very kind of critical side of the book, I suppose, in a way, which is, is uh, you know, it's a kind of theme in the book, which is, uh, and of course, this is true of every culture, every society, people have capacities not to see what's in front of them, you know, and mm-hmm. pretend somehow not to know. I suppose you could call it cognitive dissonance, you know, where, where yeah. we, we, we know something and don't know it. But I always said that you remember when Donald Rumsfeld went on about known unknowns and, and unknown mm-hmm. unknowns. I said he missed the Irish one, you know, which was the the unknown known. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the dark side in a way because it's you know the, the it was a society which was very very um, narcissistic in a way. You know, even though actually you know by objective standards it wasn't doing that well, but it compensated for that by saying, well, we we are exceptional catholic exceptionally holy and so the law in ireland you know when when i was growing up and really up to the 1990s the law was basically catholic teaching mm-hmm. you know as it related to sexuality reproduction women's rights all those kind of areas so divorce mm-hmm. is unconstitutional it wasn't just banned it was unconstitutional uh contraceptives contraceptives were were banned you know you couldn't you couldn't buy contraceptives um g- gay rights were you know mm-hmm. completely abused uh and so on and and all of this was in in the uh service of trying to maintain this image you know this this hyper catholic image mm-hmm. And again, I would stress, I, I'm not criticizing religion. This is really not basically to do with religion. It's to do with what happens when you get this fusion of religion and politics, as I was saying. You know, so you had... But, sorry, who is this image for? I mean, it's it's yeah. for the others, right? And, and exactly. They, they perceive it that way because you, you're kind of misleading yourself. You said in some ways, I would say you'd be suffering for no apparent reason because it might not have the effect that you think it does <laughs> absolutely i mean nobody really cares you know exactly that's right <laughs> it's, a, it's 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 it, it's purely a form of sort of uh self-congratulation you know in a way and mm-hmm. um and and of course people suffer for it and and always the people who suffer most are women yeah. Yeah. it's taken out it's women's job to maintain the purity of the society yeah. so so we had um we had horrendous institutions, you know, uh, uh, just hard to get your head around. And I, I, I do kind of write about these things and describe them because uh, so women could be locked up in in things called Magdalene laundries, you know, which some people may have heard of. There was a movie a few years ago called Magdalene. Yeah, laundries. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, like I mean, this was like the last one of these closed in 1996. Like we're not talking about the 17th century, you know, where so basically women could be taken. If a woman got pregnant, but even not necessarily getting pregnant, but she might be, you know, judged to be in moral danger or something, you know, and a, a young girl might sometimes taken off, incarcerated in these institutions run by nuns, made to work in a laundry, you know, some sort of symbolic idea of, you know, cleansing herself, you know, doing reparations, mm. slave labor, effectively. These were commercial laundries, and 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 in many cases, these women were incarcerated for life. They never got out. They became institutionalized. Could could never leave. Horrendous stuff. Yeah, no, I I I've seen the movie. It was very, yeah. very you know, and, and a lot of this now the, the, the thing um is that these institutions were within a democracy, right? With with a relatively free press, with an independent judiciary, with all the things you think would be the checks and balances, right? Mm-hmm. And they were there, they were right in front of people. <laughs> they weren't, you know, it's not like they were off on an island somewhere, you know, really remote. I mean, mm-hmm. the last one that closed is you know, it's it's about ten minutes walk from the very center of Dublin, right? It's inner city Dublin, 
you know. And everybody knew about them. Everybody saw them. Uh, most a lot of people had their laundry, you know, commercially got their clothes cleaned in them, and decided not to know that that this was slave labor, you know, by women who had been institutionalized with no legal process and and and, and no uh, no right to do this to, to anybody. They hadn't they hadn't committed any crimes. Th that sort of thing, you know, and and of course. This is what killed the church in the end, though, you know, so uh, I mean, it is the cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. absolute power comes when you have both the spiritual and the temporal uh, systems under your control, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the church obviously had the spiritual control, but it also had huge political power. And yeah. Uh, this made for complete impunity in relation to child abuse, for example, by 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 clergy and priests. Yeah. So it meant that they could they could carry on, you know, with things that in any institution should have been really red lights going off, you know, and and alarm bells ringing. There's something wrong here. No, they just kind of you know could shunt it away. If a case ever, you know, if somebody complained, parents complained, or whatever, they didn't go to the police. They went to the bishop. And the bishop said, uh, "You know, you know, you've done right to come to me. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll look out. I'll look out for it. You know." And they just moved the guy onto some some other place. Yeah. You know, another kids. Now this happened in America as well with again with the Catholic Church in particular. But not, and again, it's not a particularly Catholic thing. Any institution, any institution, I don't care what it is, where people have impunity, hmm. where there's no checks and balances, there's no consequences, you will have a significant minority of people. Who will abuse that power you know and they will learn because this will happen over generations and they learn that they can abuse it in pretty much any way they want you know? there's an arrogance that comes with that like and you kind of like go even further because you say well i'm untouchable nothing can happen to to me and that that is that is very scary that is very scary to you. absolutely and I, you know I, I remember this as a kid you know because a lot of this abuse was quite open we as kids always knew about it you know we always because it was your friends or it was you know it was in, the, it was in your in in the school classroom or you know whatever uh and you you learned this this is the terrible thing is knowing not knowing you know so you you knew you couldn't talk about it you know even if you did talk about it, what was going to happen like so so even if you told your parents about it what were they going to do you know go to the police the police would just go to the bishop <laughs> you know? yeah yeah to the priest but the priest might you know might be an abuser or, or but anyway we'd, we'd all go back into the church's control you know so it it, it was this sort of system and uh it, it sort of ran through a lot of things it's 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 a it's a it, as i said like you would find this in in most societies in some form but i think it became really uh you know it was the the deepest part of of our psyche in terms of the way it worked and you could maybe trace it back to colonialism you know, generations of of oppression, and you know, people learn these habits of mind to sort of survive, and get around things, don't confront things, you know, try try to to avoid trouble. Uh, but you know, it's really only in the last twenty five years that we've really started telling the full stories about our own place, you know, um, and 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 this is a very painful process. So, you know, it's it's not nice stuff. It doesn't it doesn't fill anybody with joy, but it's a very necessary process. And ultimately, it's a healthy process, you know, because if you keep this stuff buried, it it doesn't go away. It's like what we were talking about with the legacy of the of the violence in, in the north, you know, it, it just goes into another generation. And I think out of all this sort of failure and pain, I think we've we've got to a place where it's it's a much much more open and honest place now than it than it was uh, when I was younger. I'm curious about while writing the book. I mean, you 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 go through painful experiences as well, but was it also liberating? Was there like some new insights that maybe came to you? How did it make you feel just going through through your life story and uh, looking at these uh, specific events? You know, it, it was very interesting. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you've written yourself about your own uh, past, you know, but um, uh, one of the things I, I realized was I, when I was very determined to sort of keep it factual, you know, hmm. I realized I had memories. I had some stories I was going to put in the book, you know, and I, I was absolutely certain they had happened. You know? <laughs> and, and I realized they can't have happened like that, you know, that, that when I started just checking 
dates and things. And I realized, no, I mean, I'm wrong about, you know, so you, you do realize that memory is very, very slippery. You know, we, we remember remembering something and then we tell the story over, you know, to other people as for the music story and it gets more amusing as time goes on, but it, it may not be actually uh, keeping any relationship with what really happens, you know? So I, uh, uh, that was a bit chastening actually in a way, you know, sort of realize that, um, I've got to try to apply my journalistic rigor to myself yeah. you know, yeah. as, as much as I possibly can. Um, but I think uh, um, I think what struck me, uh, it, it was sort of humbling in a way, you know, I mean, um, one of the things that really just sort of came across to me so strongly was uh, if, if you're a published author and you're teaching in Princeton and you've had a you know, a journalistic career. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm, sorry, I'm really great. <laughs> look, look at all the stuff I've done, you know. And then you think, well, why didn't my parents do this? You know, they didn't do it because they didn't have the opportunities. You know, they didn't do it because the society they lived in did not afford them the chances. It didn't give them the education. It didn't give them the freedom. And so I, I'm just so struck by, um, you know, how... Uh, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back, you know. Um, we, we are products of our society, you know. Uh, not not entirely. I'm not saying you know we, we're just kind of machines, you know. But but our lives are shaped by the circumstances and the possibilities and the opportunities that we have. And of course, then you know we have to go and take those opportunities if if they're there. But 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 you know. Uh, having lived through a society which has had both extremes in a way, you know, has gone from being, just to take an education, you know, it's the worst educated society in Europe when I was born. It's the best educated society in Europe now. Is that because the Irish got smarter? Mm. Absolutely not. You know, is it some genetic thing? No. <laughs> you know? Uh, but they did get smarter in the end, like if you look at the, the outcome. But, uh, but, yeah, but again, I mean, more educated, the process, but, yeah. But you know, the basic capacities were always yeah. there. You know, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. You, you have to release them. So it it sort of made me um, more more humble in in mm. in a certain, certain way, and it also made me um, I don't know just more relaxed about all these issues of identity. Uh -huh. You know, we we get tied up in knots about them now. Yes. Of course, they're used for political purposes. You know, with culture wars and all the rest of it. You know, it 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 really is kind of interesting to have gone through a lot of this stuff and and seeing both the really bad results of mm -hmm. of these kind of um, you know hyper binary identities. You know, where you're one thing or the other. You know? mm -hmm. um, and and also seeing then the possibility. One of the things you realize with the Irish story is that actually, you know, people are very comfortable with having different identities at the same time <laughs> we, we we can live in two worlds we can maybe live in three four who knows but you know human beings are very very uh flexible and open and and capable of moving between different contexts and enjoy different kinds of versions of themselves you know and, uh, and so you know i mean rock and roll didn't obliterate irish traditional music you know okay. irish traditional music is fantastic you know still still doing really well a lot of the people who listen to Irish traditional music, you know, are very happy to, you know, listen to U2 as well. You know, <laughs> U2 would be happy to listen to Irish traditional music, you know, and maybe be inspired by some of it. And, you know, culture is a, is always a kind of ferment and it's always a sort of exchange. And it's always, you know, the, the more ideas you have, the more voices you hear, the better, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, our, Ireland is now... This again was unthinkable. I mean, when I was born, Irish people emigrated. Nobody <laughs> emigrated to Ireland. You know? You'd want to be out of your cotton picking mind, you know, <laughs> because there was no jobs. There was no. It wasn't in a place that had economic attraction. Now, about seventeen percent of people living in Ireland were born elsewhere. You know, a lot of people come to Ireland looking for work and you know to further their careers or to be educated or whatever. And it's fantastic. You know, it's it's it, it just it doesn't make Ireland less Irish it makes it richer and, and more interesting and you know there's more people adding to the sense of of what the place should be uh, so you know it, it, in that sense uh, we live in fairly grim times you know and, and a lot of the messages we hear are understandably fairly pessimistic but actually writing the book 
made me feel reasonably hopeful. <laughs> and I, I hope, although it's a book with a lot of dark things in it, and I hope it's an honest book, it's, it's not romantic, but I do hope it kind of feels, broadly speaking, for people like there is a sort of hopeful story there somewhere. And there's a good naturedness, I, I find, with the, with the Irish story and with you just talking to you, because there, I, I, I like that. And despite here the, uh, the the hardships and the suffering and so on, there is still something that is, you know, enjoying life and still being good natured about things. So just to I remind everyone, uh, Fintan O'Toole, uh, you're an Irish Times columnist. Princeton University professor and author of the book here. We don't know ourselves, a personal history of modern Ireland. It was such a pleasure, such a joy talking to you, Fintan. And likewise, uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, I hope, uh, hope your listeners enjoy it too. Thank you so much.